Please stand if you're able as we continue our worship with the reading of God's word. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Praise God for the reading of his word. You may be seated. Well, good morning. How's everybody? So, so? I'm going to sit for a second. Um, it's really a blessing to see Alina and Sylvia baptized. In, in some ways, baptism shows us or represents the ultimate act of healing. Our text today is about healing, and in some ways it does, because it, it, it shows us, it shows us dying to sin, right, as the text that Aaron read from Romans, uh, as he read, shows us that we, that we die to sin and that we rise to new life. And part of that, part of that is escaping physical infirmities. Sickness and death came into the world through sin, through the fall. Now I know today, one of the reasons I'm sitting up front today, uh, besides being tired, is because, is because this is a hard topic for people. Everybody here, most everybody, has lost somebody that they love. Everybody here has asked the question, at some point, why? Why did this happen? Why did my grandmother have to die? Why did my husband or wife have to die? Why did my um, niece have to die? Some of us, unfortunately, have asked other very hard questions. But these kinds of questions can be very difficult to deal with. And also sickness. We wonder why we have to continue enduring such sicknesses. Some of you have chronic conditions. How many of you have chronic conditions? Okay. Right? This is a continuing, ongoing pattern that you have to deal with. And so, so the text today can be hard for these reasons. As we think about our society, our society has, and I hope some, someone here may think this is an overstatement, but I'm going to try to show you it's not. Our society today has made healthcare a golden cow, a golden calf. And it's worshipped. And it's the ultimate form of self-worship where if you fixate on it over a lifetime, you get to put all your attention and energy onto it. You probably don't realize this, but the United States spends 3.6 trillion, that's trillion with a T, on health care. Now, to put this into perspective, if that were a, a, a global economy, if that, were, if that were an economy of a nation, that would be the fourth or fifth largest entire economy, GDP, of a nation. That amount of money is larger than every national economy besides the US, obviously, China and Japan. It's right about the same size as the national economy of Europe, I'm sorry, the national economy of Germany, which is the largest in Europe. It's bigger, it's over twice the size of the national economy, all products, services, and goods of Russia. It's bigger than the national economy of India. 
It's bigger than the national economy of Italy or France or the United Kingdom. It's 17 to 18 percent of every dollar made and earned in the U.S. To put that into perspective, when you, when you work and get a dollar, 17 or 18 cents of that will eventually find its way into health care. It's an unsustainable figure. It's over $10,000 per person per year. For a family of four, we're talking about $40,000 per year on health care. How could such an unbalanced situation arise? It's a golden calf. People are not worshiping God. They're not focused predominantly on Christ in their hearts and mind. They're focused predominantly on themselves and their bodies. So, that's sort of an entry point, at least, to see the scale of the problem as we just start to discuss something about healing. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong idea. Most doctors, not all, just like anything else, most doctors are very nice people. Most nurses and people who work in medicine are very nice people. Um, it's not, quote-unquote, their fault, although it's kind of odd to me that I've never yet met a poor doctor, right? There should be a few poor ones. Um, but let's get going with the sermon now. Uh, do we ask Jesus to heal us? That's the first question. When you have a problem, when you have an injury, when you have a sickness, when there's an illness, is your go-to place, Jesus, heal me? Is your go-to place, Jesus, heal me? Or is your go-to place, to, to, call, to call the doctor's office and schedule an appointment. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't schedule an appointment. I'm not saying you shouldn't use medicine. Don't get me wrong. These people have helped to keep me alive for the last 30 years through cancer. But, right, but where's your go-to place? Where do you go first? What's the, what's the speaking of your heart? Is it towards Christ or is it faith in man? The fact is that God preserves us all the way, lovingly, all the way through this life into eternal life. Sickness, sicknesses and illness, illnesses, what others think is weakness, we know is strength. We have this treasure in jars of clay. So do we ask Jesus to heal us? Do we ask Jesus to heal others? Do we place our faith in Jesus? Um, I personally think that we all need to spend a lot, lot, lot more time praying for other people and the physical conditions they might have. This is one of the very, very, very worst things that's happened about the church splitting basically generationally where there's young people churches, middle-aged churches, but young people especially, and older folks' churches, is that, is that you, know, you know, at each of these stages in life, there are very different concerns. As you get older, your concerns do increasingly need to be around your physical health. You have to take better care of yourself if you're going to continue to live by God's grace. So, so part of that, younger people, is knowing the older people in the congregation, knowing them intimately, knowing their health needs, and praying for them. Regularly. Regularly. I had a terrible job about 15 years ago at First Baptist. I got one on one of those prayer chains. You know what time they assigned me to? It was a 24-7 deal. It's before I was a pastor. You know what time they assigned me to? About 3 a.m. I'm supposed to wake up every day at 3 a.m., and pray, and mostly it was for the health concerns of older people, and that's okay. That's okay. It was praying for healing, right? You get where I'm going with this? Today, we see Jesus' direct healing, and it's real. The Bible teaches us to go to Jesus and Christians when we're sick. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, you're bigger than us infinitely bigger. 
Lord, you're stronger than us, infinitely stronger. Lord, you're smarter than us, infinitely smarter. Lord, you are perfect. We are not. Lord, you do have the capacity to heal us at any given moment. You govern the entire created order. You set the sun and the stars in place. These faulty secular worldviews which have taken over, in many ways, they're man's attempt to control his own destiny. But none of us can control our own destiny. Destiny, Lord, as your word says, we can't make one hair white or one hair black. So, Lord, help us once again as a church family, as individuals, but even as a society, to turn our health concerns over to you, preeminently to you. It doesn't mean we don't believe in medicine. It doesn't mean we don't believe in doctors. But we don't believe in them the way we believe in you, Lord Jesus. Jesus, help us, heal us, bring us as a group together to a point of healing. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Life change is difficult, right? You say you're going to lose 40 pounds, you lose four, and you quit, right? That, that double quarter pound cheeseburger just starts looking too good, too delicious. There's too much sizzle on the bacon, right? Habits, including bad habits, are strong. Western civilization has known this since Aristotle, one of the architects of Western civilization. He taught that the most important means to happiness is right habits. Now, he was a little bit off about that because, because he didn't know Jesus, but he was right about the importance of habits. When we get into bad habits, they're very, very hard to break. This is another reason we need Jesus. Jesus transforms our lives. He takes us out of a bro broken condition and brings us into a healthy condition, spiritually, emotionally, physically, intellectually, on many different levels, if we will turn our lives more robustly over to him. We need to go to him for healing immediately. Now, as you heard me say before, the reason the medical establishment does not change, and this is important, that's why I'm talking about it. The reason the medical establishment does not change is because it's big business. Did you hear what I said before? We spend more on health care than the entire economies of every nation in the world but three or four, if you want to stretch it. This is big, big, big business. There's a way to live healthier without becoming dependent on all of these things. So we can't count on the medical establishment to change. They're focused on profit. Americans must once again, we at least as Christians certainly, must once again take our practical faith and put it into Christ, not into medicine. Uh, medicine can help, there's no doubt about it. You'll never hear me say otherwise. Right medicine can help. However, medicine is part of God's common grace. Like the air, like the water, like food, Doctors and medicine are part of common grace. When we mix that up and we start putting our faith into them instead of into Christ, that's where the golden calf syndrome can begin. Now, some of you might go, well, Tim, 
why you keep talking about this. I mean, I get, I get what you're, I get what you're saying, kinda. I, I, I'm not sure people do. I'm talking about belief. I'm talking about faith. Who here misses a doctor's appointment? Anybody? When you schedule a doctor's appointment, do you miss it? Or are you there? You're there, aren't you? What about your prayer time? Do you miss that sometimes? What about your time? I'm not talking about coming here. You go wherever you want. What about your time in church? Do you miss that sometimes? Do you forget to take your medicine every day? I have to take two or three medicines a day now. I don't forget to take my medicine. People forget to pray. They forget to read their Bible. They forget to go to church, but they don't forget to take their medicine. See, see what I'm getting at? Practically, many people's faith is much greater into the, med- the medicine and the medical establishment than into Christ, at least with regard to their health. Right? And this is not a biblically consistent view, as we can see from our text today. Let's go ahead and look at our passage. Please read with me at Mark 1, 29 through 31. Oh, I need my glasses. We're not talking about magic here either. We're talking about Christ. Verse 29. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Having overcome the enemy, we saw that a few weeks ago, having overcome the enemy, having overcome the unclean spirit in the man in the synagogue, Jesus Christ now begins to overcome sickness. You see, what he's doing is he's, he's, re, he's, he's placing a reversion of the entire created order back away from the fall. Sickness is a result of the fall. When the Lord Jesus Christ shows up, when the kingdom shows up, all of the things that are the effect of the, of the fall start to be reversed in course. This is an extension of that. That's why this follows so closely on the heels and is actually paired, next week we'll see this, paired with casting out demons. Our sermon today has three points. Number one, fellowship. Number two, touch. Number three, serve. Number one, fellowship with Jesus as it relates to healing. Number two, the touch and command of Jesus as it relates to healing. Number three, serving Jesus as it relates to healing. The title of the sermon, Jesus Heals. The extended title is, Jesus Heals You When You Are Available. Listen to what I'm saying to you. This is a challenging statement for your life. It's a direct challenge to the way you think and behave. Jesus heals you when you are available. When you are available. Point one, fellowship with Jesus and healing. Please read 29 with me again. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Notice, and please mark well, that the disciples are fellowshipping and planning to eat with Jesus immediately after he teaches in the synagogue. Immediately after. It's an important clue for how our time is to be spent with Jesus. Jesus' teaching is accompanied by our fellowship with Jesus and each other. It's relational. Now, some people think that Peter's house is very, very, you know, Simon Peter. Some people think that Peter's house is very, very close to the synagogue, perhaps even connected to it. I'll leave that kind of a question to the historians. 
What we do see from Scripture is that they are at the house very, very fast. They left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew. The idea here is that they're going to eat together right after service. Right after service. Now, a lot of our ethnic congregations, I wasn't going to bring this up, but a lot of our ethnic congregations do a much better job of this than we do. As far as I know, the Korean, Spanish, and Chinese congregation eat together after every service. Now, I'm not saying that's the way it has to be. And when I came here, we implemented, by God's grace, the overall community meal. But I am saying that there's an important thing going on here. You're not going to know somebody's sick unless you're around them. It's that simple. We can send out all the email chains and everything else we want and That's great, and it helps. It's a Band-Aid. But the reality is when you see somebody and you're around them, you start to care for them. And when you're caring for a person, you start to pray for them. And when they tell you, my knee hurts, you start to pray for them. I hurt my back for the first time in years in in a baptismal on the second baptism today, lifting. I immediately went to my wife, and Ruth Ann. So we can pray. So we can pray. If I'm not around them, if I'm not talking to them, if they don't know about it, that prayer's not going to occur. Okay? So, when they get to the house to enjoy a meal together, there's a problem. The chef is sick with a fever. They notice it and deal with it immediately. Look at verse 30. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. Immediately. This is incredibly important for two reasons. First and most importantly, because Jesus cares. Second, because they tell him about it. You know that Billy Joel song. Tell, I'll say him, tell him about it. You're supposed to tell Jesus about what's going on inside of you. Emotionally, physically, psychologically, intellectually. You're supposed to go to Jesus and tell him about it for healing. And other Christians to pray for you. He cares. Tell him about it. Furthermore, because you're in fellowship with Jesus and each other, he's around. Or better said, if you're following me, you're around. Jesus is always around. God is everywhere, right? The Holy Spirit is is present in our life. But you're around. You're available to talk to him. You're available to ask for help and healing. He cares. We tell him about it. This is an incredibly simple formula, guys. Be with Jesus, tell Jesus. Be with Jesus, tell Jesus. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. What Peter and Andrew don't do is say, Hey, mom is sick. Let's go someplace else to eat. Right? That's what we would do often, right? I've done this. I'm guilty of it. We don't feel well, or our family member doesn't feel well. We skip fellowship. This makes sense on paper, but it doesn't make sense with Jesus. Um, I'm just going to throw it, finishing this section, I'm just going to throw a challenge out to you. How many of you in the last two years have visited a sick Christian in their home, the hospital, or the nursing home. Okay? I, some might not be raising their hands because they're shy, but otherwise we're looking at 25%. The, it, this is something that has to be done. 
This, this should be happening. You, people should be doing this every month. Hey, I understand that we're in COVID now. We're going to talk about touch next. I understand that we're in COVID. I understand that the hospital is not letting, some hospitals are not letting family members visit COVID members for the last few months. That's happened, and even that family members have died, unable to see their loved ones. It's not right. And if it was a Christian nation anymore, this would not be happening. There's no way. Because you'd have 200 million people wanting to knock down the doors to walk in and pray. That's all I'll say about that. We have to be persistent, like the persistent widow, like the centurion who beckoned Jesus to heal his daughter. We have to be persistent in our petitions and appeals to Christ, to the Lord, for the sick and the hurting and the injured in our congregations, in our church family. This brings us to point two of our sermon, Jesus' Touch. Please read verse 31 with me. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. What's the significance of Jesus touching Peter's mom to heal her, or mother-in-law? Just as good, same thing, right? Peter's mom to heal her. What's the significance of Jesus touching Peter's mom to heal her? Care. Care. What's the significance of Jesus lifting her up to heal her? Command. Command. When Jesus heals us, when Jesus directs us, when Jesus teaches us, it's always care and command care and command. I don't believe I've read that or heard that from anyone, though I should have at my young age. When Jesus heals us, when Jesus teaches us, it always involves care and command. To see this even more robustly, let's look at the comparable verse given in Luke. Please look with me at Luke 4:39. And he stood, Christ, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever. And it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Here the command function is even more emphasized. He stood over her and rebuked the fever. He spoke to it. He drove it away. He commanded it like the unclean spirit. He cares for her by commanding the fever to leave. He is the maker, the master of all aspects of the created order, including these kinds of spin-offs from disease and illness. Once again, I think we must leave our modern presupp presuppositions aside when it comes to Jesus. I remember once, the Lord Jesus Christ lifting, unexpectedly in the hospital, lifting a woman out of a coma. The doctors and nurses came rushing in, and they said, we don't know what's happened. We don't know what's happened. We thought we were going to lose her. Now she's up. All of life, including sickness, has a small s spiritual basis. We may not know how to speak to diseases, but Jesus does. Jesus does. Remember how the Holy Spirit prays for us when we don't know how to pray. He, he, prays, he prays in a way that is unintelligible to us. Right, Romans, right? Jesus, the Lord, knows how to speak to Sicknesses. This should not be a stretch to understand. Hey, I've got a little dog. Who's seen my little dog, Flip? He looks like Toto. He's like 10 pounds. I love Flip. I was holding, I, was, I, I attended a, a, a bar mitzvah service yesterday in London by Zoom, and, and I brought Flip on my lap. 
It was a wonderful, it was a wonderful time, right? But I love Flip so much, but I can turn Flip right towards my face and his little face towards mine as I care for him and, 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 and rub his neck. And I can talk to him all I want, and he's not going to understand the complexity of those sentences. He's not going to understand the abstractions in those sentences. Sure, he might understand it if I say go or sit because there's been so much habit and there's so much emotional content behind it that somehow he's put a sound together. But he does not understand language. We may not understand the language of speaking to sicknesses and illnesses, but Jesus can. He can speak to, the Lord can speak to them and drive them away. He mediates, if you want to write this down, he mediates even sicknesses for us. He mediates all life for us. He even mediates sicknesses for us. We pray in Jesus' strong name. This has profound implications, even especially for COVID. COVID is a disease, but the church has not taken the lead in rebuking it. I remember when, uh, I remember, it's up on my wall in there still, cut out from the Wall Street Journal. I remember when COVID got going and the Pope got going. I'm not saying anything negative about the Pope. Don't send me an email. The, but the Pope got on the big screen and basically that was going to set the tone. There weren't going to be mass for a while. There wasn't going to be church. There wasn't going to be any of this stuff. Front page of the Wall Street Journal. You can go look at the date in my office. Right? Guess what? Guess what? The church has a role in praying away COVID. But it's not taking its role very seriously. I can tell you that. How many people spent hours this last week praying that COVID goes away? Maybe a few of you did. But I don't know that we have as a church. We haven't. It's my fault. Right? We need to pray COVID away and ask Jesus to speak the words to drive it away. Also, why do we think that everything has to only be in words these days? Why can't we express ourselves more through actions and service? Believe me, serving the community food is an expression of gratitude that the Lord has provided for us. Serving the community in any way is an expression of gratitude. Now, you guys know me. I think most of you do. I'm not a faith healer or a so-called charismatic. However, the word does teach us to pray for the sick and that by Christ healing will occur. Touch is an important part of this. Please turn, if you will, to Mark 16, 18. Just the very last part. This, is, this point two is on touch. Just the very last part of 16, 18. This is the Markian Great Commission. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Telemedicine might be okay, but it's no substitute for laying your hands on someone and praying for them in the name and power of Jesus Christ, walking in the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. If you look a little further up, you see in Christ's name. This cannot happen if we cannot lay hands on, excuse me for saying this, this cannot happen if we cannot lay our hands on people who have various, various sicknesses, including plagues of different kind. Um, including leprosy. I was on a boat with a family of lepers in Indonesia, and I shared a meal with them. This is 30 years ago. And um, the young lady offered me a potato, and I took it. 
Are we willing to lay our hands even on lepers and pray for them? Are we willing to lay our hands even on people who have the flu or COVID or other diseases and pray for them? You be the judge. I want everyone to be sick. I'm sorry, I want everyone to be well. I want this, excuse me. I don't want anyone to be sick. I want everyone to be well. I don't want anyone to be sick, but I do want the sick to recover. This, this, the formula here involves touch. You can't leave that out. Jesus' touch is important for healing. Jesus' touch through us is important for healing as the Holy Spirit carries us. Okay, point three, serve. Okay? We're chugging along here. We're almost done. Point three, serve. Please read the very end of verse 31 with me. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her. And then look at this last part. If you underline, she began to serve them. Serving, brothers and sisters, now we're going to get into another hard thing. Serving is a practical expression of gratitude, wellness, thanksgiving, love, and mercy. Like the sinful woman expressed a tent. You remember the sinful woman who washed? Who's got long? Which ladies have long hair here? Okay. My daughter does. You remember the sinful woman who took her long hair and washed Jesus' feet with her hair? That, if you remember, was an expression of a tender heart, faith, and repentance. Peter's mother, likewise, expresses love and gratitude by serving them. Uh, Who can you serve as an expression of gratitude? Um, How can you put yourself in a position to serve someone during this time of COVID? Not necessarily who has COVID, but someone, right? Right? When Jesus gives to us, when Jesus heals us, we serve because we are grateful. Now, um, this is is probably the very, at least for me, this is probably the very most dangerous part of this sermon. I generally avoid talking about Kathleen because she's an introvert and she's my wife. And guys, you don't want to tick your wives off by talking about them, especially publicly. You might find some itchy powder in your clothes if you get my drift. But today, I do need to mention Kathleen because she has an amazing and encouraging story by God's grace. Uh, Kathleen serves and has a servant's heart, praise God. She serves people, she has served people and families at the hospital and also as a psychotherapist for over 25 years. For over 25 years. She was in government work, it would be time to retire. No offense. Why does she do this? Over 30 years ago, Kathleen, uh, I didn't warn her I was going to do this, by the way. Over 30 years ago, maybe I should have, Over 30 years ago, Kathleen had a terrible disease and was paralyzed from the neck down for six to eight months. At age 20 or 21, you know, her dad, a military officer, had to carry her to the bathroom. At this point in time, Kathleen was on track if I understand correctly, to become a business person or an accountant. (laughs) Can you imagine Kathleen as an accountant with some glasses and a calculator? I absolutely can imagine her with her personality as an accountant. But she was on track. That's where she was going before this massive illness hit her. After the illness hit her, she switched her studies and her major, her studies, and graduate school from business to social work. Why did she do this? 
She may not have even known it at the time. Why did she do this? To serve. To serve. Because when we've been sick and God heals us, the outpouring of a grateful heart is to serve. It's to serve. How many of you have been sick? Very sick. I'm not talking about the bug or something like that. More than this. Come on. Give me some hands. Okay? Think back on that time and remember that Jesus healed you. Jesus healed you. God healed you. Whether you know it or not, at the end of the day, God healed you or made possible the conditions of your healing. Now that you're back to normal life, don't you want to express that gratitude? Of course. And how could we do it? By serving others who are having hard times. By serving others who are ill. By serving others who may have fallen upon difficult circumstances. Gratitude to God and service. And so look. Look at what you see here in verse 31. He lifted her by the hand and, lift, and lifted her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. She didn't say, okay, now I'm better, and now I'm going to take a nap, or now I'm going to go take a walk, or now I'm going uh, to start playing gin rummy with my friends. No, she, she served. Grateful Christians serve. Grateful churches serve. Christians that have been healed by Christ, healed physically, healed emotionally, healed intellectually, healed psychologically, healed spiritually. Christians who have been healed by Christ serve. And this becomes or is an expression of gratitude, an expression of love. This is not works, quote unquote works. This is grace from God. This is his mercy. Please turn to Romans 12. Look at verse 1 with me. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. This, is this what we're doing? with $3.6 trillion a year being spent on health care? Is this what we're doing? I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is your spiritual worship. This is your reasonable service. Logizomai in Greek. This is your spiritual worship. Brothers and sisters, we forget far too easily what Christ has done in us. When we remember his life and his healing, we know what to do. Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose. Marvin, will you stand up for a second? You don't have to come up here. Marvin's standing right now. He's standing right now. Imagine a thousand years from now. Is Marvin still going to be standing? Yeah, he is. In Christ, he's going to stand. That's what the resurrection means, to stand again. Marvin's not just going to stand today. He's going to stand forever in Christ. Thank you, Marvin. Jesus Christ, and so please connect the dots with me. Jesus Christ brought our souls the great healing. For Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose. Jesus Christ brought our souls the great healing. You too have been brought to new life with him. You've been healed perfectly and eschatologically forever. Prepared in Christ for every good work. Let's pray. Lord, thank you 
Lord, there's not a Christian here that you've not healed the spirit of, that you've not brought to new, new life, that hasn't been born again by the operations of the Holy Spirit. That, that is the most profound healing of the soul that can ever occur. But now we still hear we have to grapple with the effects of the fall. We have to grapple with these physical bodies and sickness, illness, injury. One day we'll have a perfect body. One day we'll have a glorified body with you. But that's still a ways off. Until then, Lord, we ask you to heal us. Until then, Lord, we ask you to help us. And until then, Lord, as you do heal us, we ask you to help us to serve, to express our gratitude as Peter's mother does, not to be self-centered, not to get fixated on ourselves, but to serve you, Lord. We thank you for all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.